again, I don't know if it's, if it's because, you know, I'm turning 58 and maybe my hearing is not what it used to be, right? And I, I know some of you are looking at me and saying, 58? I still smell the Similac on your breath, right? <laughs> but can we get a, loud, a louder amen for that music that was played? Amen. amen. Oh, what a blessing, right? That's what we want to hear as people are using God's gifts that he has given them to the blessing of the, of the church or the congregation. You may want to turn me down just a tad bit because you know I'm loud. So, Sabotage part Two, part two, yeah, you missed one. And, and I was talking to some of the folks, some of the folks came up to me and they said, Mike, you know, I was looking forward to part two. You know, part one was really good. And I, and I, and I was thinking, I was saying, well, part two has point two, three, and four, because we just did point one in part one, right? But rest assured for some of you, I'll try to make sure I have you out before your stomachs start growling, because part one was a little long, right? So we'll make this one a little shorter. But if you have your Bibles, if you can hold them up, wave them up so I can see your swords, whether it's on your digital phones or, or you have the physical Bible here with you, and let us pray. Father God, by your word we stand and we stand alone. May your congregation hear your truth. May we toss out self and only your still small voice rules in our lives. May my Harris fall to the background and your people hear you clearly in Jesus' name. Your people said, amen. So a, a, little, a little review, a little review. So we talked about in self-sabotage, the number one issue, the number one issue that people do when they self-sabotage is bad habits. They've developed bad habits and bad habits are number one. And so we talked about last week, there are several keys to overcoming bad habits. And those keys is first acknowledgement, right? Acknowledging you have an issue, acknowledging uh, the issues that you, 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 you are struggling with. And then make a decision. Do something about it, right? Decide to live better. Decide to have a choice. And that means that you need to go in a new direction. We talked about turning our back to sin and facing the path that God would have us go and moving forward, right? Because if we don't turn our back to sin, then we will continue down that path. And finally, leaving us with no Excuse. No more excuses. Just move forward in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? But the enemies to all of that is failure to recognize that we have an issue. Failure to recognize that and to admit that, yes, we too struggle with sin. And then when we understand that and we make a decision, we don't want to procrastinate. Time to change. Remember we talked last week, cold turkey is time to change. It's time to move forward. And then when we decide to move forward and we're moving forward, we have to make sure that the direction that we're going lines up. The action that we take matches the choices and decisions that we made to live for Jesus Christ. And then finally, making excuses will always keep us in this same place. Excuses out the door, bad habits defeated by Christ Jesus, and we move forward. Amen? Amen. So that leads us to point number two, a need to control, a need to control. You know, I was speaking with my brother earlier this year, around January, and he was telling me about this of one of his friends, a close friend that he has. And his friend had lost his brother several years back to colon cancer. And they had lost their father years before that to colon cancer. And so my brother was telling this, this friend, that, you know, are you ensuring that you're getting your colonoscopies, showing up for your tests and stuff? And, you know, and, and we don't have colon um, cancer in our family, but we make sure we um, 
do those colonoscopies, even though the, it's nasty drinking the stuff, right? Come on, we all, we, I, I see enough gray hairs that we know it's nasty drinking that stuff, right? And so, and you got to drink a gallon of it at that, right? But, but we have to do it so we get our colonoscopies in check because cancer is a slow growing cancer, right? So, so, so they, if they catch it in the early stages, you, you have a wonderful chance of survival. It's, it's when you don't go and you let it get to a point where then it, then it gets tough, right? And so this friend of his was saying, no, I don't need to go, you know, I, you know what I'm, I, there's this drink that I'm going to be drinking and I'm going to the gym and working out. I don't need to do those type of things. Really, he was f fearful of, of, you know, it's in the family and he was fearful of, the, of what might happen. And so, and he didn't feel like he was in control. So he was trying to take some control in his own mind, but his fear was driving that control. So he wouldn't do exactly what the doctors were suggesting that every five years because of his risk that he should get a colonoscopy. And so he didn't do that. And so my brother was explaining to me, he was on the phone with him. That guy, he was, the man was crying, this is a grown man crying because he got the diagnosis that he had stage four. And so he's no longer with us today. Trying to control what he didn't have control of. And sometimes I wonder if we do that spiritually. That there's things that are out of our control, but we try to somehow get in the midst of it and control it. And it causes pain and suffering in our lives. So why is this a huge problem? Why do so many people feel like they need to control the circumstances or situations that they find themselves in? Rachel Goldman says, how attempting to control negative um, effects, of, um, effects on our lives People who try to control everything may experience more stress and anxiety than those who don't. Did you know that? That when you try to control everything, typically it's then you try to look out past everything. You wor worry about everything that might be there. I remember this one lady telling me that she didn't like to go on airplanes because they go down. <laughs> I said, when well, you got landing gear, right? So worrying about what she could not control kept her fearful to go on any flights. Caused a lot of anxiety and stress because she was worried about that. And it reminded me and made me think about Abraham and Sarah. And you remember that God had them and they were going through the land of Egypt, right? And as they were traveling through Egypt, Abraham looked at his wife and he went, whew. Girl, you beautiful. And so he said, about when they were entering Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Women like hearing that, right? You like hearing that from your, your spouses, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And then they will what? Was he stressing? Was he having anxiety? Was he thinking beyond what the circumstances or the situation might actually um, lay out? It, it, it is true he was right in the sense that they were going to see her and say, whoa, 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 she's a pretty woman, right? So what does he tell Sarah to do? He says, or Sarai at the time, what did he tell her to do? He said, say you are my sister. Was that a lie? No, not really. She was his half-sister, right? So, you know, it's kind of... He said, that they will treat who well? Yeah. Him. Yeah. Treat him well. He was so worried. He was so much stress, so much anxiety. This is a righteous man, though, that it, it clouded his thinking. And he actually, he actually kind of put his wife in a tough situation. Because when she did say that, well, I'm, I'm just a sister, the Egyptians said, whoa, well, great. I got a, a wife for Pharaoh. So it put him in. A, a, a more difficult situation. Sometimes when we're trying to control things that we can't control, we will often make mistakes and place ourselves in a situation far worse than what we may have been in the first place. He's traveling with God. 
God has already promised him that I will make you a mighty nation. When he was going through Egypt, even though his wife was beautiful, he should have been thinking, God has this. God is in control. God will protect me. And we know God did have him because when, when the Pharaoh did get um, her, first thing he was, whoa, 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 whoa. Right? Did, 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 did Abraham end up dying? No. Egypt didn't want to be cursed. Oh, no. You get on back to your husband. I've heard of your God. I know what God does. So, 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 and we need to be like that in life, right? When the adversary is attacking, circumstances attacking, oh, no, 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 get back in your place because you, know, you need to know who I serve. And I need to remember who I serve. Rachel Goldman goes on to say, say that needing to be in control can cause criticism. Can cause criticism. Trying to control things outside your control can lead to increased criticism about everything that happens. Do you know people like that? Have you seen so, that, that folks just, man, they just complain about everything. And it's not because they're just, just, they're just mean people or bad people. No, they, they stress about these things. They think about these uncomfortable. For them, they need to have control. Otherwise, they don't feel safe. Like the woman I was telling you about that on the plane. And all it does in return is cause a lot of stress and anxiety. And stress and anxiety increases the chance for a heart attack and all kinds of different diseases. We have to learn to let it go. Feeling the need to be in control and not having it can make us feel dissatisfied. You think that's true? Yeah, absolutely, right? We see it in scriptures in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. God had delivered the people out of Egypt. They were traveling the land. He had already brought water out of the rock. And here they come and they say, soon the people began to complain about their what? Hardships. So what are they looking at? The negative stuff. They're focusing on, man, this life is hard. These things are happening to us. They, they had just been crying out from freedom for over 400 years, asking God to deliver them. He delivers them, and they say, oh, what these hardships are. Then the foreign rabble, foreign rabble actually means multitude, mixed multitude. Um, so these are a, a, this was a good number of people traveling with them. The, um, many theologians believe that these are the children. They're not children traveling with them, but they're the children of Egyptian fathers. Um, and so when, when God set the people free, the, 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 the seed, the children of these Egyptians went along with their Israelite mothers. And so they were traveling, but these are adults. Many of them were adults. Some were probably kids, but these are adults. And they're traveling with the Israelites, and they began to crave the good things of Egypt. Did you catch that? They started craving the good things of Egypt. And then what happened? And the people of Israel also began to complain. This is why sometimes we got to be careful on the people that we mix with and we take on the journeys with us. Because when we take a for foreign beliefs, foreign world, foreign ideas, foreign concepts, when we get caught up in the way that the world thinks rather than how God thinks, the world will begin to bend our thoughts and processes rather than us bending their thoughts and processes. Because when you're on that traveling um, path with them, you're walking in agreement. See, you can't, you can't travel to a place with somebody when you're in disagreement, right? Right? That's a difficult thing to do. But when you're in agreement and you're lockstep together, then that means some compromise had to take place. 
And when they begin to complain, you begin to complain. See, they started to see the world through their eyes, rather remembering the hardship of slavery, that whip that was on their back, them hours that they had to, to build whatever the Pharaoh had them build without their permission. You just go out and do it. And they began to complain. They said, oh, if some meat, oh, for some meat. They exclaimed, we remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. Can you, can you see the psychology, the thinking that's going on? They're becoming so dissatisfied. They, they're sitting up there thinking that this free food that they got, which was really, well, I got to feed you. Otherwise, you won't be able to build my buildings, right? My, so, 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 and we had cucumbers and melons, and they started talking about all this wonderful stuff, and they had it without no want. And they say, but now our appetite is gone. I don't, I don't even feel taste. I don't even want to eat nothing anymore. All I keep seeing is this manna that you have been giving me. God is working a miracle. He had just freed you out of slavery, out of bondage with mighty miracles. And now when you're hungry, he says, I'm going to feed you from heaven. I myself, I'm going to give you all the nutritional value you ever would need to grow big and strong and be fruitful. And you're saying you have no appetite? Whew. If we continue to read this, it goes on and they, they, they start complaining and, and they say, well, sure, God, you can bring water out of a rock, but can you give us meat? <laughs> oh, all we see is this manna. When we go through trials and tribulations and struggles, there is a temptation to forget about what God has been doing and what he is doing and how he's leading and there's a temptation to focus on the hardships and become dissatisfied with not just life but God himself. We begin to question God himself. So what can't we control? We fast forward to the day. We're sitting here in this church we're going through life. And what are some of the things that we don't have control of? Help me out, church. What's some of the things we don't have control of? Okay, we don't have, the, we don't have control of the weather, right? Those of us who live in Yuma, especially in the summertime, we, we, we love getting beat up on anyway, right? We, we're into the torture, right? So, so to those who go away, they say, I don't want to hear nothing y'all talk about, about no weather. Y'all like getting beat up on. But anyways, what else? Politics, right? Can't control them politics. Well, I guess we, by our vote we try, but they, they have other ideas, right, many times when they get in office. What else? What else, Pete? Time. Oh, man, time flies. What else? Life and death. Don't have control over it. And if we constantly worry about it, when I'm going to die and what I'm going through, all it's going to do is create stress and anxiety that will put you there sooner. It's people's choices, right? Other people's choices we can't control. That's a, that's a wonderful, that's a powerful one, right? Because then we can go through hardships and stuff that's not even our own choice because of what other people have done. Yes. Oh, yeah, prayer, amen. We're going to we talk about this in the second perspective. So they're on this journey, right? And I want you to look at the picture. And are they on the same ride? Yeah, right, same ride, same journey. And, and do they have two different views? Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes and no. Oh, my sister's on it, right? Yes and no. So is, 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 the, is the journey, the view, what they're looking at, is, is that in their control? No, no, after they purchased their ticket and got on, what they see is what they see, right? They don't have control of the environment that's around them, what, what they're seeing, right? So the, so the person who's, who's looking all sad and miserable, it's out of his control, right? And the person who is looking with the big smile and looking at the one side, it's 
out of his control, what he's looking at, right? So, so the control that he does have, the guy that's all sad, could he look to the other, other side? Yeah, right, he could just turn his, turn his head, right, and look over at the sunny stuff. But would that really change his disposition? We don't know. Why? Because what can we really control? My sister said earlier, perception. Perception, which will direct our response and our attitude, right? Our perception of how we view the world that we're in. Our perception of how we view our trials, our hardships. Our perception is everything. And when we recognize, you see that little sun like in the background? When we understand the real sun, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who is and always has been, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who was never elected or can be uh, voted out of office, is in complete control when we recognize that we can't help but put a smile on our face. Perspective is how we begin to stop self-sabotage. Perspective. And so God says this, come to me all who are weary and burdened. Anybody weary and burdened? Huh? It is not today, hey, amen. It's Sabbath, it's Sabbath, right? But we go through some things in life. And God says, I will give you rest. That's his promise. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You see the two pictures there? In Jesus' time, there was two types of yoke. Right. One was a yoke that was designed for um, farming. Right. And they would take animals like you have a, um, an ox and take two strong ox. And this yoke was designed to bind them together. It would go across their back and you would put the weight of the harness and they would just drive and plow through the, the fields. Right. The other one was designed for a person and it had this arc in it that sat around your neck, it sat right around here in your traps. And then it evenly distributed the weight. And they would wrap it with wool or something to sit right here on the shoulders. And that allowed them to place heavy objects, much heavier than they could carry like this, for considerable distances. It was designed to take the pain and suffering, the struggle, out of the task. So God is saying when you're going through something that has you weary, that has you burdened, I will give you rest because I will be your yoke. I will carry and take away the pain, the struggle, the suffering, the torture from the journey that you are on. I am your deliverance. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He is promising he will take care of each and every one of us, no matter what we go through. Even if we have to go through the tunnel of death, he says he will be there on the other side calling you back to life. For death here is nothing but rest. Nothing but rest. So Jesus says, I got you. The kids say, ride and die, right? Jesus said, I'm the author and finisher of the statement, ride and die. I went and actually died for you. I'm sitting on the right-hand side of the Father for you. We sent, we sent God, the Holy Spirit, to dwell in you. I've given you all these promises. I've given you prophets. I've given you my word, and I will return for you and place my robe of righteousness upon you so that you will have rest. When you consider, Rachel Goldman says, when you consider that trying to control everything causes stress and anxiety, peace and relaxation are the opposite of that. When we can finally let it go, 
and say, God, I'm trusting in you. I don't need to have control of it all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make what? Your path straight. You want to you walk straight into heaven? Trust in the Lord with all your hearts and all your soul and he will make your path straight. Having cast all your anxiety, remember we just talked about trying to control Creates anxiety. The Bible says, having cast all your anxiety on him. Because why? He cares for you. He cares for each of us this year. There's a saying, your strength is how calmly, quietly, and peacefully you face life. When you place your trust in Jesus... No matter what you're going through and you decide, I'm going to surrender. Then you get a peace that's a pass all understanding. I shared with some, many of you this story before. I'll share it one more time, real quick, really quick. My mother-in-law, wonderful woman, died at a young age, 48, right? Or 45. Died at 45. Cindy said, get that number right. 49. Get that number right. Get that, I'm all over the place. Get that number right. Leave me alone, Cindy. Let me tell this to 49. And, and, and of breast cancer. On her deathbed, some of you have heard the story. On her deathbed, when we were all around, because she, after it came back the second time and went all through her body, she said, I'm done with chemo. I don't want any of this other stuff. Put me on hospice. I'm ready to rest. She said to her family, she said to us, Jesus is going to heal me. He may not heal me right now, but he'll heal me on that day. Amen. He'll give me a new body. Amen. All of you be there. See, she, she was resting all of her hope and trust in Jesus, and it gave her the peace to go ahead and close her eyes and rest. Casting all our cares on him. Number three, comparing yourself, comparing yourself to others. Comparing yourself to others. You see how the, look at that, that side difference? I think back in the late 70s, there was a supermodel called Twiggy or something like that, right? And she was super, super skinny, was a twig. And everyone, they were putting them out there, and all the young ladies were trying to model themselves after this twig, right? This, this lady that was twig, real skinny. And what it caused was anxiety, stress, and all types of low self-esteem and other addictions because they were trying to look like something that wasn't actually what for them designed to look like. And so we have to be careful, and this is why the Bible tells us that when we run, this journey, we're on this race, that we're to run the race with perseverance. That means you're going to go through some stuff. So you've got to run in a way to, as to what? You have to run, we'll talk about it in a second, the race that was marked out for us, you. Each of us have a different race, right? I remember a quick story, tell you a quick story. Fastest school, we were in, we were in um, elementary, not elementary, we were in um, junior high, and we were the, the fastest kids in school was going to race for a 40-yard dash, right? And uh, I was like the fifth or sixth fastest, so I didn't get the race in this race, right? Because it was the top three. So I'm over there watching. And so they get ready to take off, and they take off running, and all of them are real tight on their race. And Justin, this kid in just, named Justin, he was in the lead by a hair, right? And so he's running, he's getting close to the end where we're standing, and he looks to the left, and he sees this kid named Keith, and then he looks to the, and he's a little bit ahead of him, and he looks to the right, and he sees this other, uh, other kid, and the next thing you know, when he turned his head back, Keith had passed him and won the race. Because when you look to the right or left, it slows you down. When we focus on what other people are having, what other people do, when we're trying to compare ourselves to them rather than Jesus Christ, it will cause us to lose the race. Focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. 
run in such a way as to gain the crown and win. R Rachel um, Goldman talks about this negative talk, this negative words that we like to speak to ourselves that sometimes go unchecked in our minds and starts to unravel things. And as soon as we, we get into a situation, the trigger words happen, right? And then next thing you you start hearing back all the, the negative words that you've repeated over and over and over in time. And it can cause you to act in a certain way and do things and make decisions that can be harmful in your life. But the Bible says rather than do that, this is how we deal with negative thoughts. He says, we demolish arguments in every pretension that set itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it what? Obedient to Christ. So how do we do that? How do we take every thought and make it obedient to Christ? The Bible says, finally, brothers and sisters, after Jesus Christ says to, to you, you can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. He goes on and he says in, here, in this chapter, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right or pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, flood your mind with these things. These are the things we should be thinking about. And they will counteract all the negative stuff that you grew up with, that you placed in here. They will overwhelm so that you may have the victory in Christ Jesus. Point number four. Number four. Attempting to gain others' approval. Attempting to gain the approval of the world is how we She goes on and says, Jennifer says, um, Gutman says, people who work to um, please those in their lives to reduce fear and abandonment, unfortunately, this can lead to much deeper compulsive behavior patterns and um, complicate ment complicated mental health issues. She goes on to say, it can cause fear of rejection, resentment, anger, frustration, low self-esteem, addiction, bullying, and eating disorders. As some of you know, I, I told you from, kindergarten, from kindergarten to fifth grade, I experienced bully, bullying. And it was this one kid that used to bully me. And I learned much later that him and some of his friends would, would bully me. He, they would get him to bully me because they, were, um, they didn't have their dad in their lives. And I had both my mom and my dad, and they were jealous of that. And so they would encourage this one kid that was bigger to try to bully me. Trying to, he was trying to please them. He was actually a nice kid, but he was trying to please them, and so he ended up doing some things that he later regretted. Do we see this in Scripture too? Trying to, the devastation of trying to please others, right? On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Oh, we're not even going to discuss what was happening there. Prompt by her mother. So this is not her choice. Prompt by her mother, she asked for the head of John the Baptist. Now watch the domino effects, right? She's trying to please somebody else. And then she asked for the head of, of John the Baptist. He says, well, I got to do, Herod says, I got to do what I promised I'm going to do. Go get John the Baptist, throw him in prison. We're going to be heading. John the Baptist is in prison. Right, and he's sitting in there, and he's waiting. He's probably thinking, well, you ain't getting my head. Mm -mm, do you know who I know? Right? Luke chapter 7, verse 18 through 23, tells us that he started getting a little, oh, wait a minute, a little worried. And so then, and so then so some people came and visited him, and then he said, he said, can you go take this message to Jesus and ask Jesus, are you the one we were looking for, or should we be looking for someone else? So the messengers went to Jesus to take that to Jesus, and they got to Jesus, and, and right when they got to Jesus, Jesus had just finished healing a man who started to walk. He had healed the, the deaf from hearing. He had healed him of many di different diseases. He had preached the gospel to the poor. And they witnessed all this, and they said, here's a message. Here's a message. From John the Baptist, he wanted to know if you're the one. 
Jesus said, go back and tell them that I've healed this and I, I've taken the, the disease from people and that I preach the gospel to the poor. I'm the one. But what John the Baptist and others around him didn't understand, Jesus was basically saying to him, I'm the one you expected. It's just not how you expected me to be. We often expect God to arrive in our lives. And when he does, sometimes it's not how we expected it to happen. Trust him no matter what. John the Baptist had to come to a conclusion that he was okay with losing his life because the Savior could pick it and grant it back up again. For I, Paul says it this way when it comes to pleasing people, for am I now seeking the favor of people? So that's what politicians do. You may vote them in. They may start off good, but then they got to listen to all the other people who can give them favors, that can keep them in office, that can pay, pay them money so they can keep their campaigns going. And they got to listen to all of them. And they start listening to them more than they listen to your vote of why you put them in office in the first place. He says, am I, am I looking for the favor of people or of God? Or am I striving to please people? Then he says this, if I were still trying to please people, you notice that he said, if I was still trying, because there was a day that he was trying. As a Pharisee, he was trying to please that religious set. And the consequences of that, he was arresting children. He was arresting mothers. And he was putting to death men, women, and children because he was trying to please somebody. He says, if I was still doing that, I would not be a, a bondservant of Christ. We cannot please the world and be servant of Jesus Christ. The two don't mix, they don't go together. And so when the world start beating down on our doors, talking about the world culture and the world idea of what the church should be like and what we should accept and what we should not accept, we need to say no to the world and yes to Jesus. Because the two don't mix. I would rather be a bond servant of Jesus Christ than to look righteous in the world's eye. And so in order to stop the self-sabotage nature. Pete, I hope you've never done this before. He's still here. Let's end the bad habits. Cold turkey, let's say no. Let's say no. We know that there's still going to be struggles. We know that, that we're still going to have temptations. We know we're going to be tempted to look back and head the other direction. But let's continue to say no to the bad habits and yes to Jesus. Can we say, I don't need control of everything, that I can just trust you, Jesus? Can we move to a place where that we're not comparing ourselves to one another in the world and trying to keep with the Joneses and all this other type of stuff, that we're just all, we're good in you, Jesus. I'm content with what you have for me, Lord. And that people pleasing, the only people pleasing I want to do is when I'm serving you. Outside of that, I'm only trying to please Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm only pleasing Jesus Christ. I'll serve you and choose to please him. Let's stop self-sabotaging and let's run that race to gain the prize of a relationship, oneness with Jesus Christ and his body. May God bless us.